Hi everybody, this is Jeffrey Thomas. I'm here with Mark Tracy. And uh, brought to you by MailChimp.com. And Doritos. And Doritos. The coolest ranch monkey in town. <laughs> We're going to talk about God's debris. Coming straight out of you, St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah. Chatting it up. Chatting Wednesday up. night style. Couple of guys talking. Couple of guys talking. Well... We're going to talk about God's Debris, which is a book by Scott Adams. And very much in the introduction, he says this book is designed, or he, he, he would hope you, something to the effect that he would hope you enjoy talking about this book over a drink with a friend. Perfect. So I think this is a good book to, to discuss. So yes, I reread God's Debris recently. First read it a year, a year and a half ago maybe. And then I reread it recently in preparation for our conversation. Remind me, I, I actually, I was on a long drive and I had the... Um, Audiobook. I don't know. I don't think I, actually, I think I just did like a, on the iPhone, you can have the iPhone read it. Oh, I want that so bad. It's like Siri. I want that, no, I don't want her voice. Yeah, exactly. It's that. not, it's, so it's like bad. a robot and it's not yeah. even as nice as Siri. It's like a robotic, but anyhow, that's so, that's how I listen to it really fast. Ooh, so, that's even cooler. Yeah. Okay. I love that idea. Anyway... Um, so I don't even know how much I remember, but, but I wanted to ask you about the, um, the ending. What was the, there was some like nice message at the ending about, about how a person should live. Yeah, there was. Something like, something like, well, there was like kind of go with the flow of probabilities. Yeah. Do we want to start there? Right the no, end? maybe not. Maybe we do. Uh, yeah. But, uh, maybe we do because I. Okay. So the idea is, yeah, is go with the flow of probability and improve your odds of success by working with probability rather than against probability, right? Yeah. Uh, so. And wasn't there something like, and be nice to or something like that? Well, I kind of, the whole story was a, was a handful of these conversations that were all happening over the, a single sitting, right? Is the idea. And then at the very end, it's like a... It's almost like an add-on chapter that says, and then we also talked about these things, and it just plows on a pile of really interesting ideas that maybe only needed a sentence to get across. Yeah, be nice was one of them. Um, but anyway, but yeah, they were they were uh, things I thought were really interesting, and I think reading those in isolation uh, maybe would be off-putting or something like that. But I feel like being at the end of this story and this journey that you kind of just went on. With the main character, main characters, um, they seem to fit in, and I think your brain at that point is just kind of overwhelmed with the other crazy stuff that's been going on. That it's just like a way to slip in some good life advice, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. I honestly think it's like a distraction. The whole the whole story or the whole book is trying to do its own thing, but while it's so busy consuming you, I think it was like a sucker punch, kind of like other set of ideas. That aren't contradictory, but hmm. are useful. Do you remember the ideas? Like we should, we should actually look at yeah. that chapter. No, so but so the main idea of God's debris or God debris, God's debris, God's debris. is that God killed Himself, and yep, the, the debris is all of us. Yeah. Well, the and, main the main idea is that an all powerful God will be bored, so killing itself to see what happens next might be its only option. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just a crazy idea, right? But why not? Okay, I'll go with that that thought. Yeah. Because that, that, that's a lot of the rest of the book flows from that idea. How could an all-powerful God be anything but bored if it's all-powerful? Right. And I guess what's interesting to me about it is its relation to Scott Adams' like large project in general, which... I listened to the uh, a podcast he did with Sam Harris. Yep. Did you listen to that? Yep. Over multiple days, you know, like yeah. 15 minute drive here and stuff. But yeah. So, and I think that Scott Adams' stuff is really compelling. You know, he's very, I don't know if it would be, if apologetic would be the right word for Trump, but he basically is like, he sees Trump from perspective of this master persuader idea and that there is potentially some greater good that's going to result that's going to come about from 
these actions that are that people don't like and whatever, but they're mis they're misinterpreting it. And he, from from his perspective, it seems as if he's saying that the means to getting to the ends are okay and good, and um, it they don't matter really. And and that's my my big question about it is like why like why shouldn't shouldn't that matter shouldn't shouldn't the means by which we get to the ends even if the ends are desirable to everyone shouldn't it matter if you were telling the truth or not going getting there i think absolutely it does matter there's i think this is i can't speak for scott but this is my two takes on this um because my wife has asked me the same kind of question number one I think Scott is just trying to be a reporter yeah. of the behavior and activity and methods that he sees. And right. he's not necessarily endorsing or not, but being that he can see them so well, he does enjoy kind of his role. For sure. But I don't think he necessarily endorses every action Trump may or may not take, right? At the same time, well, there's maybe even a third edge to this. Um, he might, Scott might argue that and I would maybe be in the same boat. A lot of what we're saying Trump is doing wrong or not doing right, or however you want to phrase it, is just the way it's framed by his enemies, which is, I hate to say it, but mainstream media does not like Trump. And anybody who questions that, like, oh, the media, you're making the media into a fake boogeyman, they are actively working against his chances of success, right? They're they're fighting his probability. And then the third aspect there is, so he's a, this guy happens to be a reporter, he might argue that Trump's own words are being framed poorly or out of context. And then the third thing is, this is my own conclusion that I came to recently, people can always claim a moral high ground. So, yes, maybe these methods or the means to the end aren't right or are right but regardless of how you go if you regardless of what your moves are if you dislike your opponent you're always going to claim a moral high ground as part of your putting down of that side right in the realm of politics probably for sure mm -hmm. but in everyday life i don't know i'd like to think that there's more opportunity for collaboration and cooperation. I would agree. And I think I was arguing with numerous people recently, or discussing maybe, that I think Trump is a Democrat in disguise. And everybody's like, what are you talking about? That's the craziest idea ever. And then two days later, half his cabinet's gone, and the only people left are Democrats. Just today, he, uh, so, uh, not signed, but he made a deal with the Democratic minority about raising the debt ceiling and just totally knocked the Republican party sent it off off their feet they had no idea it was coming and it's just like yeah maybe the means don't or do justify the ends but i think those means are being distorted and here's another example that people didn't see this not everybody saw this coming but i think i did i'd like to think i did i'm not really sure i, I just made a coherent argument well two jointed things together <laughs> at the last no i step. think what you're you're reiterating that it's possible that the ends could be good is what it's, well, it's possible that the ends can be good, and it's not my job to to do his job. The thing is, everyone's going to be like, he's doing it wrong because whatever. Even if the ends are right, they're going to hate the way he did it because they are already his sworn enemy. And when somebody publicly states their position, especially in politics, they're never going to fucking change. People who have already said they don't like him are going to continue to not like him forever. And, like, that's right. going to be really hard. To bring the comp the country together, no matter who you are, the company, <laughs> the company together. You know, like Obama <laughs> wanted to bring the country together, and half the country thought he was yeah. like, an illegitimate president. And now this next one, and half the country thinks he's illegitimate president. All right, like, let me ask. Let, let me ask it this way. So, well, how I appreciate Scott Adams' ideas is that he sees above the fray. You know, he yeah. sees the. The tribalism on both sides. He sees it, and he's saying, he's he's take he's taking out the morality, the moral high ground, and just kind of reporting from the per, like you say, he's reporting on the methods, mm -hmm. and not making a judgment in a like moral sense about the methods. Just making a judgment of about are they effective or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like morals are. A dime a dozen. You know, like anyone can have morals or claim to have morals. 
And I, I am, and the rebuttal, the rebuttal that I read, I actually read the, an article about that podcast before I listened to the podcast mm-hmm. and it said something like Scott Adams nihilistic worldview or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I appreciate that, that aspect. And I guess that's what I'm getting at with my questions is like, at the end of the day, is it a nihilistic worldview? where it doesn't nothing matters and it's just getting what you want accomplished accomplished or is there do do you believe in some kind of values me personally yeah absolutely yeah um part of being persuasive is you're leading people towards a better outcome for everybody yeah right so, I mean, ideally, and I think that's what our president's trying to do. Mm-hmm. People have let him, and he's been in the job less than a year. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm pretty nihilistic myself. I, I have to, I don't know, the, ground, the moral ground to me is very unsteady. Like, Well, to use a, an example that Scott Adams uses, not to fall back on him, is, but... He says, lying is wrong, right? We all say lying is wrong. But if the situation is you're lying to a bank robber to save somebody's life, Mm is it really wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, and and with that simple example, it just shows that morality is flexible. Everyone thinks it's like, this is the truth I stand for, but I don't think a lot of people really do. That's a part of God's debris. It talks about people say they're religious, but nobody really lives their religion. If they were to live their religion, they'd be giving away their money and they'd be serving food to the poor and they'd be sheltering the homeless. And nobody does that, or very few people do that. I mean, they may give some money to charity, but they're not living the ideal religious lifestyle that's called upon by that faith, you know, that religion. Totally. And. So God's debris says at some level everyone just knows there's a pretty good chance they're wrong with their own religion being the only one and they're they're just willing to just like do the social visual aspects of it, partly for the social benefits it brings, but also I don't know if God's debris talks about it or not, but religion certainly pacifies your brain and calms worry, you know, like it's helpful for people to to cope. Well and some, it- in some Right. Yeah, and that com- that comes up in God debris too. Is that we we prefer an answer to complex questions that don't have necessarily an answer. Yeah, absolutely. And we're designed to to see in black and white. And I can't even remember what part of the book that comes up in. We're designed to see in black and white. I remember that. But the, in, in the introduction, he talks about Scott Adams. Write specifically something along the lines, not specifically, but something along the lines. <laughs> um, that cause and effect is far more complicated than he presents in this book, and he, as a as a person, believes cause and effect is more complicated. But in a persuasive form, is what the book is, is trying to present the most simple argument possible. You know, mm-hmm. the, the simple arg- the simple answer is always the correct answer. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the, the thought. Or, Occam's razor. razor. You know, cut away all the extraneous. Um, so he's trying to present what he thinks is the most simple answer to this whole structure of, and that's where probability comes in, this whole structure of why we're here and how things happen arises from two things, probability and the fact that we're all made up of energy that's connected everywhere. Mm-hmm. And those two things are designed, according to him, to slowly build back together into God from the exploded God that we come from. Which it's kind of interesting. It's super interesting. But by presenting the simple argument here, um, it's hard to argue against simplicity. Yeah, know? yeah, for sure. But yeah, our brains certainly prefer simple and and finite versus unknowable. The other interesting thing that I remember from it is what he said about the genders. He said, uh, men, he said something like men, and this was part of that laugh. Yeah, exactly. And women want to feel like you sacrificed for them. Yeah. Yeah. And 
I mean, that was interesting. I, it didn't necessarily resonate. Resonate? Does it for you? I don't know. You know, that's that's a tough question. I mean, I think there's a certain satisfaction with feeling useful. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, again, he's trying to present the most simple argument, right? Right. So I think everybody has a lot of emotions, but I can I can. Here's a, here's the thing with the simple argument is confirmation bias that when we hear an idea we automatically search our memories for examples of how that fits right mm-hmm. so if if I were to say something about people with short hair you'll think back and be like oh that person the barista with short hair and this person with short hair. yeah he's right so whatever idea you think about you you look for confirming evidence right yeah. So by Scott saying that about the sexes, right. it's you, easy to look back in your own personal history for sure. and be like, yeah, okay, I can see that. Confirm that. it. Yeah. So overall, is it true? I don't know. It could be. I mean, it's... I don't think the sexes are the same. I don't think I'm necessarily the one to say what the differences are, but I don't think we're, right. we're identical. So I thought about it in my own relationship, the idea that, say, this, this, your sacrifice could symbolically show your love like if you gave up something you wanted to do absolutely absolutely and i and do think that's actually true for men first and well i don't know what verses but yeah i, I can see i that. mean but so it just reinforced for me the idea that like i mean that could be an example of like where i'm not using persuasion techniques or tactics to at the detriment of my relationship where I'm saying like I'm thinking to myself like authenticity is the is authenticity honesty are the supreme values in a relationship and what that means is like well not much sacrifice coming from me because if I don't want to do something I'm You're just authentic. I'm just going to say it. And yeah. I, you know what I mean? So, but if that's really true and there were a better outcome for our relationship by using that small degree of like to me that feels very strange and inauthentic and again kind of like against the grain of who I am. Demonstrate my love. That that's that's one side of what my brain says, okay. or what okay. my natural inclination is. Mm-hmm. But I think what the argument here is that that it could absolutely, yeah. Um, partly because those dishes have to be done, or whatever the task is, right? And everybody has limited time. Time is one of the most. It, this may be the most precious thing anybody has, right? Everyone has limited time. So by you giving time to your partner to do a task that one of you is going to have to do. You are giving her your time to, so she can do whatever that happens to be. Um, there's a book I have I got at a garage sale called The Six Love Languages, I think it is. Mm-hmm. Five, I think. Five, okay. And uh, it's written in the 70s or 80s. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of it. Everyone thinks it's kind of old school, but it's fascinating. And it's like you read it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's exactly me. And this is exactly my wife. And this is like how I could be... Mm-hmm. Communicating better with her, and mm-hmm. this years ago, I've already forgotten it all. But I should review it because it was great. <laughs> um, but I, I'm sure that was one of them. You know, like yeah, demonstrating sacrifice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that. You know, I. So my my point is not that I don't make sacrifices, but that I never thought of them as translating in a powerful, meaningful way. Like I always thought because I assume she's like me which is that the sacrifices you make are are just because you're a nice person or and you want to help out in the family or whatever i mean i don't get turned on <laughs> i guess is what i'm saying yeah no i hear you there um but i have actually heard that i don't know if it's true or not because you're right here probably could do more but um the idea that if you want more of a love life at home than how about more at home and because yeah for me it doesn't turn me on at all right that'd be a turn on but i don't know i'm not a woman so maybe maybe there's something to it right and then there's this the other idea it's like why won't somebody just tell us the truth (laughs) (laughs) it's like you know 
you really, you really don't want me to do what I want to do and do something for that, you that I don't want to do. That I don't want to do. Yeah, and right. you're gonna be happy about that. <laughs> Right, I hear that, man. That's interesting. Yeah, well... Because I don't think I would be in the reverse. Yeah. That's probably the the source of so much misunderstanding that we think the other person is just like us. And of course this is makes rational sense. I thought about that too when I read right? when I lo- listened to that book. Yeah. Yeah, it's just because... We, we make that assumption all mm, the time. All the time. And the law of small numbers says that small numbers act nothing like large numbers. You can't make an inference about a huge population based on a super small sample of one, you know? But all of persuasion is built kind of on that idea, right? That Well, it's built on principles that like activate our brain to move a certain way, perhaps, you know? So, in that sense, we are very similar. Well, in that sense, we are. Yeah, yeah. I think our call and response type of behavior drives drives and part of that too is programmable like if I it doesn't matter what type of background you come from if every time you go to this specific dry cleaner they give you a lollipop right and if you happen to love lollipops this is maybe a horrible example you're just going to keep going there even or if it's like a maybe a gambling thing like a it's an occasional payout like a slot machine right yeah if there's an occasional payout and you don't know when that's going to happen, you're going to keep doing that behavior trying to get that, that payout. Yeah. Even if that payout is a little icon on the top corner of your phone that says you have a new... Sticker. What? App. Sure, I don't even know what that means, but yeah, a new sticker on your phone, right? Oh, you would just mean an app. Well, like the app is telling you that you have a new message. Alert, a new yeah. new alert of something. Like you're going to keep checking it or you're going to keep pulling the, the gambling yeah. slot machine lever because... Once in a while, you're going to get that response, which is going to give you either a physical good or which will give you a dopamine response or just the dopamine response in your brain. Right. But it's enough to keep to drive you. You're going to keep paying attention to Trump. Sure. Oh, yeah, because okay. there's news alerts about yeah. how... And fear is a huge motivator. So yes. they're always fear-based about how everything's falling apart. We're all the same in that sense that... Once our brain understands yeah. that this action will give this Pavlovian response, mm-hmm. even if it's not consistent, especially if it's not consistent, if we know we're not going to get it every time, that response, mm-hmm. we're going to try extra hard. We're going to try extra frequently to get that response. Yeah, it's crazy. And phone apps, Silicon Valley has hired, well, it's probably gone back and forth a hundred times at this point. But the people that design slot machines and their addictive knowledge Mm -hmm. is hired for Twitter and Instagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they've taken that knowledge back to the slot machine companies, you know? And that (laughs) aspect of persuasion, like behavioral... Motivations and... Motivation and stuff. Yeah, just basic. Yeah, that is super interesting. And I think that might be darker than... Oh yeah, a lack of morality. I mean, that that is well, that is deciding where people are spending their time, like basically forcing them to decide where they're spending their their days. There's an article on Wired today about how this woman has well, we, a couple of months ago had had no focus because her phone was interrupting everything <laughs> she was doing. So she thought she had writer's block, but it turned out she just couldn't focus. So she like turned off all her apps and did all this stuff. And oh yeah. You know, I mean, it's like those companies are deciding where you spend your time. The minute you're on your phone and a new alert is like designed to come in only when your screen wakes up and you have to check that one. Yeah. Yeah. That's immoral. That's super immoral. And we all love it and buy into it. Okay. I had a thought. I don't know if you remember this, but you probably do. In the er, I think it was the early 2000s when reality TV started. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I remember there was a, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't much of a consumer of popular culture in that way in general to begin with, but I still was aware enough to realize that, um, there was an idea out there that reality TV was sort of like trashy. Yeah. Yeah. And that that there was like, there was like good content that was made on TV and then there was like trashy content which was like reality like yeah. and and it's yeah. kind of the attitude people take towards keeping up with the Kardashians and all these different things where it's just like 
oh, that's that's just or like tabloids or whatever or stuff. You know, paying attention to movie stars, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, at least in my demographic, there's an attitude like that's we don't pay attention to that. We're we listen to NPR, we read the newspaper, we might be watch Seinfeld because it's funny or whatever. So, but like I, a, 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 almost like a cultural separation. Yeah, cultural a different. Yeah, yeah. Well, I but don't also say it's elitist, just a, but <laughs> yeah. Well, no. It, I mean, it's it was I mean, yeah, it's a yeah. choice and like yeah. and it was like kind of along these lines of authenticity and problems with celebrity and mm-hmm. all these things, you know. But now, of course, the world is it's twenty or fifteen years later, and it's the presidency. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, how how do you feel about this argument? I don't pay attention to politics because it's reality TV and it's just not interesting to me. And I'm interested in real life. Can I say the same things that people said about TV and now say it about politics? (laughs) It's trash. Like, I don't need to pay attention. Like, it's just, it's just a show. Yes, absolutely. It is just a show. I would so, totally agree. Because, so, like, like we were just talking about... So it's a legitimate thing to say. I think so. Like I said, these fear alerts, like, it's... But, but people will say, the world is ending. I you have know. to pay attention. But that's the problem. That's, they're, they're saying season four of The Sopranos is ending. You have to pay attention. <laughs> like, yeah, that's old news, man. <laughs> like, it's not ending. America's strong, but we're humans and we're gullible. And CNN and New York Times and NPR and Fox and every every one of these news outlets, they're all money dependent, right? Oh, yeah. And they're if they're all, not money dependent, they're using the same methods. Yeah, so they want attention and they yeah. need your eyeballs. And yeah, they're making a show out of it. And in, it's now, since C-SPAN started covering the Senate, which was the most boring reality TV you could imagine, it's now a 24-7 reality TV marathon. And they have to have blazing headlines about how the world's ending because there's nowhere left to go. Like, you're at the top of the... You just have to keep pushing that one, right? I don't yeah. know where you go next. I know, so... I know, it seems... Like we mentioned earlier... But, but then it's like... What matters... I mean, or are the institutions sacred or something? We should care. Yeah, I think they are sacred, but I think, you know, like... And it's a democracy, and and part of a democracy is... So it's kind of like a level of attention, how you pay attention. It is. You're, it's like, I'm not going to be outraged, but I'm engaged. I well, the problem is... Yeah, yes, but the problem is, I, the way I experienced it, is if you're not outraged... Yeah. Everybody thinks you're a lunatic. Everybody yeah, doesn't understand. Or they think you're, like, marching in Charleston. It's like, yeah. come on. Like, yeah, I know. The number of Nazis in this country is ridiculously small. and Everybody knows fuck them. Like, everybody knows that. That's not even where the conversation should be. Right? So that's... Okay. And I that is a good... I wanted to ask about that, too. Is that that's... Everybody knows fuck them. Don't they? I... I think so, yeah. And I think, and I think, I would assume Trump thinks so. His opening, or his first statement that everybody, during the both sides, both sides thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, there was violence by the Antifa, which is on the left, theoretically on the left, right? So there was violence on both sides, but I don't want to get into that. But his very first thing he says, I condemn bigotry or hate or whatever in all, in violence in all its forms. Like... That's exactly those people, right? People who are <laughs> preaching violence or hate or whatever. He, but it wasn't good enough, and everyone like took like no the because slight equivocation statement he made and made that the headline because they have an interest in maintaining ratings yeah. and they also are interested in sinking his ship. Chan- yeah, his ship, which is fucking bullshit because his ship is tied to our country, and we're letting our fucking horrible. Tribalistic instincts. Yes, thank you. Crush possible good momentum. We have it's a new it's a new president. I mean, it's going to take a whole and he has a whole different approach to how everything happens, right? But 
we elected him to try to do a job. So let's help him do that. Let's let's give him some faith. Give him some leg room. He's everyone says he has no morals because he takes every side of a position. Well, that's how you get people in consensus to a table. He's so what do you think? Maker, and okay, let me ask you this: What's forever. what do you think the strat? What's the strategy with DACA to get them to to make a deal? I think the strategy is yeah, to get, absolutely uh, yeah. to get them to make a deal and get things moving on immigration. Yeah, he made that deal. The DACA thing was like two days ago or yesterday, maybe. He made the deal just today with the Democrats about the debt ceiling, and they know he knows immigration's a big. It's a big issue with both parties. But now he has them at the table, and he's he's negotiated with them, and they've struck a deal. They now have an affinity. They think, oh my gosh, we're the minority party, and we're working, we're making things happen with the, the majority president, you know? In the meantime, the Republicans are like, what the, is going on? And yeah, I think they're gonna force, somehow, at least force a conversation, right? We're bringing people to mm-hmm. the middle, is the idea, because the country's super split. Mm-hmm. And, I think I said earlier that once people make a an I a public statement because on one side they don't change. But he's that's his job, that's what he's trying to do, right? Because you don't believe, for example, that he thinks that our country is threatened by dreamers. Like threatened how? Like economically? Or war or how, whatever Whatever the reason is for the to DACA, reversing it, DACA is deferred action for children of mm-hmm. arrival or something. Like that, right? Deferred action. How long are you supposed to defer this? Just get the immigration figured out. Mm-hmm. You know, like deferred action means that they're in limbo status. That's not good either. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And since he since this whole thing came up three days ago. People on both sides of the aisle and major businesses have all come out and said, "We gotta help, yeah. help this." No, and, and both sides of the aisle are saying it. Everybody yeah. knows the right move, but nobody was doing anything. Until right? He was like, "You got." You, we no, gotta I thought out. that was a really compelling argument that Adams made in that interview mm-hmm. when he said, "Everybody is a lot more informed about stuff." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right. of because of this, like healthcare, and you know, people are talking about it in a way that they didn't before. Mm-hmm. And what about the um, transgender? I don't know what that's going on with that. That's weird because during his campaign, he was very Trump was very uh, pro sexual rights, right? Equal was rights. he? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, because as a Republican candidate, it was kind of... Yeah, like, I mean, it's t- it's so clear, like, especially when so the whole sure. Bannon, when Bannon left, it was like, it felt like, oh, okay, this was happening all along. But it was symbolic. That, he was appeasing people. Absolutely, by having Bannon in there? I yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And... And not only was he appeasing part of his base, um, he was also just driving his opponents bad which I think he just had fun doing. <laughs> you know, like... Oh, my God! <laughs> in uh, The Art of the Deal, he says something like, if it's not, if you're not having fun doing the work, you're yeah. doing it wrong. Right. And uh, certainly he's got a big job. Well... And the president's like the worst fucking... Not the worst, but a very difficult job, certainly. But I think his specialty <laughs> is understanding what makes people tick, right? Including in a bad way. In- including in a way that's going to aggravate them. Mm-hmm. And as a politician, with opponents in the public sphere it's good to set them off sometimes you know right but speaking of which speaking of your earlier point about him being a democrat his i think his son-in-law is kushner yeah yeah, yeah. and or his daughter former, maybe now that he's in the cabinet they might have had to like change some party affiliations but yeah i think i don't know yeah i don't know how that yeah. works i don't yeah. maybe you don't have to I don't know either. But yeah. He, I, I in Wikipedia, think, he's listed as a Democrat. There you go. <laughs> right? Like, and but so, and I don't know if that's a media thing, but they did make, there was something about him versus Bannon. Yeah, there was. Yeah. But see, I'm sure mm-hmm. Bannon was in on the deal too. From, uh, tr- don't you think? Of being let go? Of just his whole arc. Like, I'm bringing you in. This is how it's going to play out. Because he's. Very possibly, like he's, I don't doubt uh, it. You have to have a transition team, yeah, that people are going to support. Like General Mattis wasn't going to be in his anything early on. He wasn't going to support 
some candidate that people thought were crazy or whatever, but once it's a president, a sitting president, and that president asks you to be his chief of staff, you don't say no to that, right? Right. So that, there had to be something in the middle. Yeah. And the mixture of appeasing and aggravating. And I just think for, you know, and the guy like this is going to be good for you, Steve. Maybe. Right? Like, we'll do it this way. And Maybe not, though. I don't know. Maybe he was caught by surprise. I don't know. There was just... Or there was some kind of falling out. but Or maybe it was all just a plan. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah. But I could totally see it. Steve, this is going to be good for you and me. Right? Yeah. And... Because he's a deal maker. He knows yeah. what things are going to happen. And, not only that, it was like a slow drop of one mm. cabinet member... And then maybe two, and then one. You know, it's like a way to keep the news media focused on these scandals in the White House. Or not, but whatever. It was like, I think it was intentionally orchestrated by Trump's campaign. I mean, certainly some of them crazy stuff imploded, but like that BS off the record interview with Anthony Scaramucci, he came in, he fired some people, and then he did this off the record thing that was obviously on the record. And two weeks later, Somebody else did an off-the-record ban and called a left-wing news journalist. And, yeah. Like, come on. This is... And then, like... Have you seen... Do you remember that show, Northern Exposure? Like, season three and season five finale, they burned their house down twice. It's like, come on, we've seen this. How is this still on the air? So, yes, it's totally... It's totally a... A news circus a, yes. media show, and you are totally forgiven not to pay attention. I think the best advice I remember hearing, probably Scott Adams, was just read the headlines. The headlines, you can kind of get a feel if they're like skewed or not, but it's when you start reading the article, you get these like, you get fired up about one thing or another. Right. Yeah, just read the headlines and move on. Although, unless it's like clickbait headlines, and then... Just read them and move on. Yeah. If the, if the headline doesn't give you information yeah. that you need... I mean, obviously, I don't know. There's something I end up reading, everyone does, right? But I guess the idea is like, don't constantly be sucked into everything that's trying to grab your attention because they all are trying to grab your attention for money, every single one of them. And yeah. it's, it's up to us to, like, turn off the phone notifications. Mm -hmm. Only check Google News four times a day and New York Times twice a day. <laughs> you know, whatever. You're, cut it down, I guess, is my, my... Or, you know, whatever it is. Only do it at, after lunch or something. Well, Because otherwise it's constantly pulling us in, right? Well, I my thought about the whole idea that it's reality TV and I don't have to pay attention is... Like, the argument would be, well, your life is at stake, you know? The, you know, and my question is, like, how? My life seems to be steady and ongoing. Yeah, that's... And not impacted by national politics. Well, and that kind of goes back to God's debris, because you are doing things that improve your probability of stability and success, right? Mm -hmm. Versus... Somebody who might be afraid that Obama's taking their guns. Guns, if nothing else, are something that are, is working against, theoretically, life. Mm -hmm. And that reduces probability. So I can understand that supporting that argument reduces probability and stability. From the God's debris aspect, just getting back to that. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I, 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 and maybe that's, maybe that's where we sit as white middle-aged males right let's be honest with that possibility like exactly no i and that's um or maybe not maybe maybe that's very certain but well i don't know i mean i mean when trump was elected people, that's why it's so hard I, I fearing for their lives and marching in the street like we had the next hitler which was baloney and it's like where's when's that gonna happen when's this hitler stuff supposed to happen like well, already okay well well, if it does happen, if, okay. It, okay, if it does happen, uh -huh. um, did I hope I'm involved. Did Obama come for the guns? I'm not saying it. it oh, it, yeah, it, oh, yeah. It, if I, you know what I mean? Hitler. And how do I know? Yeah. And you know what I mean? That 
there's there's an argument on the other side too. Like the, the frog in the boiling water. Like as things temperature slowly rises, how do you know? That's a great question. Um, based on those flexible morals of ours. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, Especially. But okay, I guess the question is. Has any new laws been passed against specific groups that are, like, leading to their persecution, right? So, certainly ICE immigration enforcement has gone up, I think, 40% since Trump has been elected. Yeah, it's not a reality TV show for them. It's not. It's certainly not. But there are people breaking the law. But here's the counter-argument to that. Obama was the deporter-in-chief. At one point he was, right? And maybe Trump has surpassed that. I don't know. But you have the the question isn't is he doing it? The question is, is it happening at an alarming rate where I have to pay attention more? Right? And that's a thing like and that's where crime wolf on the news is really hard to accept. If everything is a wolf, when is when is actual Right concernable evidence? I mean it's not enough to convict or whatever, right? But, like, oh, this is maybe something to pay attention. When when there's... Everything is... Yeah. I'd like to ask fire, Scott Adams that. Right? Well, he might just say, That's a stop f- with the five alarm fires, you know? Because it's the way it's being framed by... Yeah. By the people who are making money off doing that. But he wouldn't... I mean, he seems like an opportunist. Like, they're just taking advantage of an opportunity to make money oh yeah he's he's recently said that the opposition to trump is more persuasive than than he initially thought and i think that i don't remember it, but i'm sure it was partly because it's just constant barrage of fear and i think i think that's subsided a little i mean i don't think people are happy necessarily but no i think fear is oh, subsided. i think so for sure i hope so I don't know what's going on with this DACA thing. But yes. I mean, but so, I mean, yeah, like you said, it's not a reality show or an enjoyable one for the ICE people who are being busted by ICE, right? But there are laws, they're not new laws. It's not like we're looking for a certain group of people other than, right? We're not looking for an ethnicity, we're not looking for a nationality, we're not looking for a religion. We're just looking for people who are breaking our immigration laws. And of right. course, right, right. But he, Trump, ran as a Republican in frequently or more often than Democrats. Republicans are all about enforcing the laws we have on the books, right? Like you said, Obama's deporter in chief. But a lot of Democrats maybe are looking at the humanity aspect of some of these laws more than Republicans would, because Republicans, I think, would look at the humanity aspect of our citizens. And by having these people who are here illegally and possibly taking jobs or using services might deprive our citizens of doing that. And if nothing else, if this is an acceptable behavior, then it should be changed in law to say this is fine, right? Yeah. I think I think that's just kind of the Demo- no, I'm sorry, the Republican line is like, let's enforce the laws we have. Right. Well, and from my per- and from my perspective, it's like like not not having any ideological bent one way or the other not well I do probably but but the, it's so complex like I don't feel like I can form an opinion on, on immigration or DACA or what on a lot of issues I feel like the complexity is so like I don't want people to suffer I don't want people to be kicked out of our country if they're just want to live here and just they've lived here their whole life and they're you know all they want is an opportunity and they're not criminals like i don't want that i think a lot of people don't want that yeah which is why so that that's the other thing like about god's debris is or maybe it was the interview now i'm mixing them up it's like if we're probably in agreement about a lot of things at the end of the day it's just we're not agreeing on the um the um assumptions 
Like we're we're coming at arguments with different assumptions. We being you and I. No, we, we being, being America. Two sides of yeah. the yeah yeah. And that's something that's covered in the book that we all think that if everybody had access to the knowledge that I know about this situation, they would see it from my point of view, and that's very possible that they might see it that way, right? But you also Sam Harris wrote this book called Free Will, and all of our options and assumptions and beliefs in life aren't really truly free because they're all constrained and built by our previous experiences and what we've been taught and learned and know or claim to know and everything else before that right mm -hmm. so even if we were both to come to a whole totally new topic that we've never th thought of before and we're presented with a pretty varied body of knowledge about that topic all of our previous scaffolding would define how we interpret this new topic and debate it, right? There's a possibility we'd come at it to the same conclusion, but there's a possibility not. Yeah, America has a totally different set of information that we seem to be focused on and that these com media companies and our phones are pushing in our faces. We have different information there, and we have different backgrounds that are finding confirmation in one data point versus another that supports our argument and just says the other side's wrong. And as long as that's, as long as people are making money off of that, even if it's destroying our country, which I kind of think that's the big problem here. It's not, I mean, I don't think the political parties are helping. I don't think our president is to blame. I think it's these, these crazy us versus them narratives that's being pushed. And people buy into it and they get feverish and excited and mm. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's good either. I you know, it's like you have to draw you have to establish your ideological opinions. Mm hmm You're forced to. And I'm resistant to that. <laughs> because well, I it's tough because you come I come up with new reasons why I should lean one way or another. Totally. You know? Yeah. 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 And, and if you just acknowledge that there's so much you don't know. Right? Yeah, there's constantly I mean, new information here. Like, if you remove the idea that people who don't have your opinions are evil and bad, and, like, and so what do you have... If you take that away from the equation, you know, what's left about why is there a difference? It, well... You have different information, or, you know... That's you're, exactly right. You're coming at it from a different point, and you're like... You like it's easy if they're bad and evil to yes. say they're wrong. Yes, it's evil if they're easy if they're bad and evil to say they're wrong. It's hard. Okay, I don't know how it's it's if if they have different values than you do, saying they're bad and evil is maybe morally justifiable. If they if you value life and they don't, saying they're bad and evil is justifiable, right? They are really bad and evil because they don't value the good. But if they're opinions, just like opinions about something intangible, I mean, I guess life being valuable is also intangible, but right? Their opinions, opinions should be lightly held, right? Opinions should be like yeah. something you fight for until you're like, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> right. If you think about like your opinions you had about, pick any topic, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Your opinions, looking back at my opinions. Mm-hmm. I was pretty smart. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Still have them. <laughs> Some of them, maybe. But if I haven't questioned those opinions or challenged those opinions or expanded my thought on those opinions or con contracted my thought, starved those opinions of because they don't have any confirming evidence, you know, like hopefully we're all growing, right? I agree, man. I think that's exactly right. But I also think that it's not easy for me. It's frustrating for me because I feel like I feel like that um, I feel on the outside of things, you know, like yes. But I'm also annoyed by the fact that this take your side thing, and because I want to bring brevity and lightness to it, but then it's like, well, I get that it's serious. And I want to engage in a serious way because life matters to me and people matter to me and I want, you know, so I w it's like, I don't just want to not care. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're on the outside, for me on the outside, and when I say outside, maybe what I really mean is 
the outside of the left, which is where most of my brethren social sphere is. Mm -hmm. Is on the left, um, except for some yeah. close family. Everyone is on the left, and but I think you maybe be on the, the on right the, too. It, you know, I, I don't if, talk to enough people on the right, right. To know if I'm on the inside of that or not, I don't want to think I'm on the inside of the right. I want to think I'm on the on the left. But you're right; I'm on the outside, looking at this bubble of crazy, thinking, "Come yeah. on, come on, come on." But if you you don't want to make light of it, right? And you want your friends to feel like their concerns are valid and important. Yep. And you don't want to make fun of them, but you you I can't take them all seriously because. Mm. What they're seeing is life and death. I'm seeing as manipulation in a horrible, yeah. destructive sense. I know. And they're seeing in me, well, if I'm not with them, I'm against them. And that's not the case. Right. I know. And so that's why it's good that it's all died down. Because... It's all what? Died down. Yeah. Well, right? partly the reason it's died down, I think, is because we have limited attention spans and right now we're being focused on these giant storms, right? Two or three, of, two of them have passed. I think there's a third one coming. So for the for the listening audience, Arma and Harvey and Harvey, 2017.